it's a subject that, uh, as a body of Christ, uh, we, we really need to know and understand. So that's why it just was being impressed on my heart to, to really share, share with you. So I pray this will be a blessing to you. Okay, so I'll start off um, by, we'll be turning a lot of scriptures um, just to make sure that everything we, we're talking about is, is based on scripture. So uh, in Isaiah chapter, and Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6, Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6, it, it says there, it's, it is a prophetic um, declaration about Jesus. And it says, therefore, unto us a child is born, uh, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Okay, so this prophecy is foretelling that uh, there's a child that is going to be born, and there's a son that existed eternally, but is going to be given, and we all know that is Jesus. And it says he's bringing a government with him. And then as you go down to read um, Isaiah 9, 7, just the next verse, it says, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, and upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. So this government that this son is bringing with him is a kingdom. It says, in order to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord shall perform this. We get from this prophetic declaration about Jesus that when he comes, he's not coming empty handed. Uh, he's coming with a government and that government is a kingdom. See, so the next scripture we'll go to is Matthew chapter Four and verse number 17. This is after he's been in the wilderness, he's fasted for 40 days, and he starts his public ministry. And in Matthew 4, 17, he declares his mission, and it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, so... Isaiah prophesied about Jesus that he's bringing a, a government, which is a kingdom. And then Jesus is born and he starts off his ministry. And the first thing he announces is that the kingdom is here. So in other words, what was prophesied about me many years by the prophet Isaiah is now being fulfilled. I have brought that government on my shoulder. I have brought that kingdom. And the first word he says there is repent. And repentance means to turn, to turn away from sin, to change the way we think. And then um, in John 5, John chapter, John chapter 3, sorry, John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus explains how to get into this government or this kingdom. Okay, I, I'm trying to just make it flow so that it, it will be well understood. So we, we've read about the prophetic declaration about Jesus that he's bringing a government, which is a kingdom. Now Jesus himself announces a kingdom. And then in John 3, 5, he explains how to get in that kingdom or how to get in that government. So in John 3, 5, Jesus says here, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and born of the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter into this kingdom that is brought with him. This is what initiated us or should initiate us into the faith, that we repent, we get baptized in water, and we receive the Holy Spirit. We get baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that brings us into a new realm or a new environment. And this environment is called the kingdom or the government of God. Okay, so in this, we're going to be talking about what, what is in this environment. What is it that we have to know? Every environment that you go, you have to study that environment. Otherwise, you will not be able to live effectively in that environment. So I was born and, and raised up. Um, in Ghana and I was used to that environment because that's where I was born that's where I was raised but then once I migrated to Australia it was a different environment and I have to study how this new environment operates if I want to live effectively okay so in Colossians 1 13 says um, that you've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Christ so you've left one environment and you've come to a new environment. And the next question should be, okay, 
what do I need to know about this new environment that I've come into? You see, and that's the understanding that would really help us if we, if we are to um, understand this new environment. It will cause our lives uh, to have more meaning, to have a sense of purpose, and there will be clarity as far as our walks with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so the next thing that I want to uh, begin to share on is this new environment. What is it that we have to know about this new environment that we've come into, which is called the kingdom of God or the government of God? Now, um, once we come into this environment, and obviously we come through Christ, we become a family of God, we become citizens of his kingdom, and the last thing we become is his ambassadors okay so this new environment our new titles or um uh, our new identity is first of all we become family then we become citizens then we become ambassadors we want to look at scriptures uh, just to further confirm how we become family in this new environment so this awesome kingdom of god once you get into it you're not just a mere citizen you're actually related uh, as a family as well. Okay, so the scripture um, to look at will be John chapter 1 and verse number 12. So in John 1, 12, it says there, For as many as receive Jesus, to them, to those people that receive Jesus, he gave them the power, uh, that word power there is the word authority or rights. So he gave them the right to be sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Here's what it's saying. If you repented, if you got baptized, and if you uh, received the Holy Spirit, you've entered the environment of God's kingdom. And the moment you enter that environment, you have become a child of God. Uh, the Bible says here, a son of God. And it says, you know, so you can call yourself a child of God. And the question could be, well, who gives you the right? Jesus gives you the right to call yourself a child of God. It says to them that believed him or received him, he gave them the right to become sons of God. Okay, so this is the first scripture which gives us or puts, that, puts us in our place as a family with God. That this new environment we've come to, we're not just mere people. Uh, we are actually related to God. By, we have, he's our father, and we are, his, we are his children. Okay, So this gives us a sense of intimacy with God, and it also gives us a sense of belonging. See, we know who we are. Uh, we, we, we have an identity now, and that identity is related to God himself because he's our father, and we are his children. Another scripture to look to um, is Romans chapter 8 and verse number 15. So Romans chapter 8, verse 15, it says, um, For ye, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. So this is talking about us, children of God. It says you haven't received the spirit of bondage to fear. That means there should be no cause of fear. You've been delivered from fear. It says, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Okay, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So God is saying that when I picked you up from your old environment, this is your old self in the world that didn't know Jesus. I've adopted you, and now you have become a member of my family. You've now become my child. Your identity has changed. So it says um, in verse 16, Romans 8, 16, just the next verse under, it says, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. See, God's spirit which he puts in us as we get born again, bears witness, confirms with our spirit that we know deep down in us that we have become the children of God. That's what he's saying in the verse 16. You see, then in verse 17, it says, and if children, if you're children, then you are heirs. Heirs means whatever God has, we, be, we inherit what God has. And it says, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So whatever is, is um, Christ will also belongs to us. Now, if because we're in a family, you know, that's one thing about families, that inheritance uh, belongs to a family. So whatever is God's now belongs to 
his children too because we are his, right? And that's what the scripture is saying here. And if if so be we that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Okay? So that's the second scripture here that drives it home that we have become a family of God. I'll look at one last scripture that uh, further deals with this um, identity of God's children. Uh, 1 John 3 and verse 2. 1 John 3 and verse number 2. And it says here, Beloved, now. So it didn't say later. It says now, right now. We are the sons of God. And it hasn't yet appeared what we shall be, but that we know that when he, Jesus, shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. But my emphasis will be the first part of the scripture. It says, Beloved, now are we sons of God. Okay, so these three scriptures, and there is many more we could look to, but these three is enough to help us to understand that once you've been born again, you've come into this new environment, you now become a child of God. And that's a beautiful thing, to know that the God of the universe, the creator, uh, now is, is your father. You see, we came to this world, we were born into this world as God's creation, not his children, but his creation. But because of what Jesus has done, we get to be adopted as God's family. And uh, to me, that's a very beautiful thing. It's a very beautiful thing. Okay, so that's the first understanding we must have in our new environment. Now we're going to shift into the second understanding we must have. And it's we have become not just family. We've also become citizens of his kingdom. Remember we read in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 that the prophecy was about Jesus bringing a government on his shoulder. And then in verse 7, it says that government was a kingdom. And then Matthew 4, 17, Jesus announced the kingdom. Okay, so that kingdom is talking about a country that is ruled by a king. Okay, it's talking about heaven and Jesus being the king of heaven. But he's extending the rule of heaven to this earth. So that's what it means. So we become citizens, not of this earth. We become citizens of heaven. I want to make it as clear as I can, but again, I'm, I'm intentionally repeating myself because this is very important that we understand that you have been brought out of this world. It says in John 17 that you are no longer of this world. Jesus says that, that we are now in the world that he brought with him, which is the government or the kingdom of heaven. It's the same thing that Colossians 1.13 says, We've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. We've been brought to the kingdom of Christ. Okay. So in this new environment, we have become citizens of heaven, citizens of the Lord's kingdom, not citizens of the world, citizens. So your citizenship has changed. Okay. Let's take it step by step here. So the first thing that changed is your family. That's why in John 1, 13, it says children who were not born by human will, but they were born by God himself. So the first thing that you that changes when you come into this new environment is your family identity. Now your family is identified with God. Okay, that's the first thing that changes. Now your citizenship changes. You're no longer just a citizen of Australia or a citizen of wherever you come from. You are now a citizen of heaven. There are scriptures for this one as well. Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 20. Uh, it says here, um, Philippians 3.20, for our conversation, and that word conversation there is the word citizenship. Okay, so it's very important to know that the King James uses conversation, but it's really talking about citizenship. For our conversation is in heaven. So I can put it this way. Our citizenship is not in this earth, but is in heaven. Okay. All this is doing really is driving down who we are because who we are will ultimately determine how we live. You see, and a lot of us, we can compromise or kind of conform to the world because we don't understand where we've come from. We don't understand uh, which family we're now a part of or 
where our citizenship is. And if this would really sink in, it will shape the way we think, the way we talk, the way we act, the way we live. In Romans chapter 12, it says, uh, Romans 12, 2, it says, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, what we're doing right now is we want to renew this mind so that we don't conform to the world around us. Because the Bible is very clear that we are not of this world. But if you don't understand that now you've come part of another world, then you keep acting like the world. So that's why what we're sharing is very important. Okay, so um, in that scripture we've just read, it tells you very clearly that your citizenship is now in heaven. So you're no longer just a citizen of Australia. Ultimately, your citizenship is in heaven. And that's a beautiful, that's just one scripture. There's another scripture that further confirms this truth. And it's in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 19. It says, Now therefore, we, we are no more strangers or foreigners. Okay, no more strangers nor foreigners, but fellow citizens. So he, he actually uses the word citizens. He says, fellow citizens with the saints in heaven and of the family of God. So this is telling us and confirming what we've just read in Philippians 3.20, that we are fellow citizens, even with those in heaven. So that if there's a roll call in heaven and God is um, you know, calling out those who belong to him, even though you are on earth, your name gets mentioned. Why? Because you, that's where you are originally from. That's your citizenship. And there's a whole study we can uh, look into in that area. But the very word born again means you've been born from above. You've been sent from heaven. You came from Christ. Uh, we came from God. So with citizenship, it's important to understand. Okay, just as we said, your family changes, you now become identified with God's family uh, and gives you a sense of relationship and a sense of belonging. With citizenship, it gives you um, it gives you a description of a lifestyle that you must have. So, for example, different countries act in different ways based on the laws they are under. So, if you say uh, take any country. The way they behave will be different from the way another country, be, uh, a citizen of another country behaves because of the laws that guide and control them. There are some countries that you can throw litter on the street and there's no problems with that. Uh, and then there's some countries that's against the law to drop a litter on the, on the road. You see, so different countries um, and different behavior from the citizens based on the different laws that govern the countries. So in this new environment that we've come into, being citizens of heaven, the question to ask is, what, what, what is the lifestyle of saints? What is the lifestyle of those of us that are citizens of heaven? And that's what I want to um, share on a little bit as well before we go on to uh, our, our identity or our duty as ambassadors. Okay. So as citizens, there is a lifestyle that we must have. And the Bible actually defines that lifestyle very, very clearly. Look at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews 9, verse number 15. It's talking about Jesus here, and it says, And for this cause, Jesus, he, Jesus, he's the mediator. Okay, that means he, he activated the new covenant. So he's the mediator of the new covenant. Now, that word, the covenant, our testament, it's talking about like a contract. So Jesus came with a new contract or a new covenant or a new testament. And he did that. He put that new covenant in place by his death. That's what it says in the following, that, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that we were under the first testament, that, sorry, they which are, are called might receive the promise of eternal um, inheritance. So when you take your Bible, there is the Old Testament, and then there is the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament is talking about the Old Covenant, or the Old Contract that God had with his people. And that contract was based on laws. God says, I will do all of these things for you if you will keep every single one of my laws. 
Now, the laws, and I'll go into this a bit more, um, but the laws were supposed to be only 10 laws. God gave them Moses on the, on the Mount, as Mount Sinai. He gave Moses only 10 laws, the 10 commandments. But because these people did not have the heart, uh, the Bible says they had a heart of stone. They kept rebelling. That 10 laws became over 600 laws that they had to keep in order to fulfill, let me put it this way, the 10 laws that God gave to Moses could be summed up into only two, which was love God, love people. But because they couldn't do that, they didn't have the right heart to be able to keep that law, it ended up being over 600 laws that they have to live by in order to, to um, declare their love for God and love for people. They had to keep 613 laws to say they love God and they love people because they couldn't do it. Jesus came and he bypassed all of that 613 and he went straight for the higher law. Love, he was able to love God and was able to love people. And it says in scripture that love is the fulfillment of the law. Anyone that is able to love God and love people fulfills the whole law. It says um, the, the law, maybe we should look at scriptures for that. So um, I think I got ahead of myself there. In Hebrews 9.15, we read that Jesus being the mediator of a new covenant or a new testament. Now, in every testament or every covenant, there are terms and conditions on it. Okay? The very word testament or contract or covenant being used means there's two parts. There is one part that is fulfilled by one party. There's another part that must be fulfilled by another party. Okay? So this New Testament is not just one part. It's two parts to it. Now, um, let's look at um, John chapter 13 and verse 34. Okay? So Jesus mediating a new covenant. And what does he require of us in this new covenant? John chapter 13 and verse number 34. John 13, 34. This is Jesus speaking, and he's speaking to his disciples. And he tells them this, a new commandment. Okay, commandment. He uses the word commandment. A new commandment I give you. Why does he say a new? Because there was a lot of old ones. But he bypassed all of the old because he's bringing something new. A new he's bringing a new testament, okay, a new contract. So it says, a new uh, commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And then by th 35, in the next verse, he says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to put a new testament or a new covenant in place. And the terms of this covenant is not 613 laws you have to keep. It is only one. That one commandment is love. If you keep this, you don't need all the 613. Okay? So this is a new covenant for, new, for a new citizenship. That your lifestyle as a citizen of God's kingdom, will be defined by love. And that's why he says in verse 35 that by this shall all men know. In other words, this is the one thing that is going to make you stand out as a citizen of my kingdom if you love one another. Now, this love that we're talking about is a, it's a, it's our part that we have to play in the covenant. You see, the Lord, he's our provider, our protector. Um, he's everything to us. But he can be all of those things to us when we are also walking in our side of the covenant or the testament, which is when we are walking in love. This love that the Lord is requiring of us, he is not telling us to, to, to do it in our own ability. See, he's requiring love from us in this new covenant. But this love does not come from our own ability. Because in Romans chapter 5, and verse number five, it says there, and hopes makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. You see, so it is beautiful what the Lord has done. 
he comes in with a new covenant or a new contract. And that contract says, I'll be all to you. I'll be everything to you, but you have to walk in love. But then he knows we are not capable of walking in love. So what does he do? He gives us the Holy Spirit. And it says, when he gave us the Holy Spirit, his love, his love was shed on our hearts. So he's, it is such a beautiful thing that this testament or contract that he's put in place He's giving you the ability to fulfill your side of the contract so that he can be fulfilling his side of the covenant. So you have the ability to love your enemy. And he tells you to do that in Matthew chapter 5. You have the ability to forgive people who hurt you. You have the ability to, to um, be patient with people, long-suffering. You know, there's a whole, uh, in Galatians chapter 5, fruits of the Holy Spirit, um, kindness, goodness, love, meekness, all of that. You have the ability to do it. Why? Because it says in Romans 5, 5, he has actually shed his spirit in your heart. What enabled the Lord Jesus to be able to live in the higher law of love for God and for people is equip you to be able to do it. You see, so Jesus, he didn't necessarily get rid of the old um, um, law of Moses. But he raised up a people who would live on a higher principle. And that higher principle is the higher principle of love for God and love for people. Because he said in his teachings that unless your righteousness bypasses or surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom. He's raised up a people who are more righteous than the Pharisees. And they demonstrate their righteousness not by keeping a set of laws, but they are able to love God and love people genuinely and sincerely. And that's an awesome thing. So this is to cover this area of being a citizen of heaven. This is the lifestyle that is expected. And now I say it is expected. But let's just put it this way. It is a requirement. We have to walk in love. There is many other scriptures. But in 1 John, it says, He who loves, who loves, who walks in love, walks in, in the light and walks in fellowship with God. But he who walks in dark, who hates his brother, who, he who hates his brother walks in darkness. You see? So when you're not walking in love, you are not fulfilling your terms of the covenant. And God is therefore not obligated to be these things, to be your provider or your protector and all of that. He's not obligated to do it. Because you are going away from the testament, the new testament. Love is a requirement. Uh, in James, he calls it the law of liberty. And it's talking about love. And in some places, it's, it calls it, it's referred to as the royal law, which means this is a law of love. Um, I believe in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, it, it's also referred to as the law of the spirit. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Jesus. You see, there is a law of the spirit and that law is in Christ. So when you came to Christ, you didn't necessarily uh, become free from uh, from law altogether. You became free from the law of Moses, but you've now come into into come into the law of the Spirit, where you are required to walk in Spirit. Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death, and He did that by moving us into the law of the Spirit. Okay, so this is the understanding that we must have um, that when we were released, or when uh, those that kept the law back then. Um, I'm talking about the, the, the Jews or the Israelites when they were under the law and they kept it back then when they were freed from the law when Jesus came to set them free from the law it wasn't freedom to be lawless it was a freedom to move into even a higher law which is the law of love uh, Love. It's, that's what Jesus was teaching he says look you have heard it said eye for an eye and tooth for tooth but I tell you um, that whoever slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. That's a higher, a higher law of love. You see, the law of Moses would have said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Now, to move into that place where you can turn the other cheek, you need the Holy Spirit. You see, you need the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. And that's why, by giving us the Holy Spirit, he empowered us to live on a higher level of righteousness, even more than those that were under the law. That's why he said about John the Baptist, that he's the greatest of all the prophets, but even the least in the kingdom is greater than John.
Okay, so that's that's a little bit about citizenship. We've talked a bit about being family. We talked a bit about our new citizenship, which is in heaven. So this, this is the lifestyle of our new environment. How do I know if I've met a kingdom citizen? I just watch their lives. Are they walking in love? Do they love their enemies? Do they bless those who persecute them? Do they forgive? Now, when we're not doing this, we're not working as citizens of God's kingdom. You see? So um, you can read Matthew chapter 5. Jesus teaches about the standards of this new environment. But let's bear in mind, we, we do none of this in our own ability. He's giving you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one that works through you to live out this life. Because it's a heavenly life. It's too high. John says that which is from above is above all. You see, it's, a, it's too high. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit, the one from on high, to help us live according to the high standards of God. And the last thing we'll talk about is being ambassadors of God's kingdom. The foundational scripture that we will look at is 2 Corinthians uh, and chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. And we're going to read down to verse 20. It says, "For Therefore, if any man be in Christ, and it's awesome already, it says any man, any man. So whoever is in Christ, he tells you who you are. He says you are a new creature. And, and this, you, it's easy to read past this very quickly, but it is saying something very powerful there. It is saying that you're no longer your old self. You see, this confirms everything we've talked about so far. When it says that you're no longer your old self, what happened to your old self? It tells you in Romans 6 that your old self died. That's why you get to come in a new family. That's why you get to have a new citizenship. Why? Because you, you become new. You become a new creature altogether. You see, so he says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And he says, old things have passed away. The word passed away is, it means it's gone, it's dead, it's vanished. It's exactly what Romans chapter 6 teaches. That when you got baptized, your old self died with Christ. And when you were brought out of the water, you rose up into a newness of Christ. You know, you, you became a new creature altogether. And he says, behold, all things are become new. Now, this is beautiful. He didn't say some things have become new. He says, if you're in Christ, you've become a new creature and all, all things, all things have passed away. Old things have passed away, but all things have become new, not some things. So this is where if you're still having habits from your old self, this is a scripture you can stand on and, and walk by faith out of those out of those habits because you're not supposed to have them. Old sinful habits are no longer supposed to be a part of you. It's supposed to be cut off. And then it says in verse 18, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. So it, it tells us what Jesus came to do and Jesus came to bring man back to God. Our God reconciled us to himself by or through Jesus Christ. He didn't stop there. And has given us or given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, Jesus said again in John 17 that as the Father sent me, so I sent you. That is what this scripture is confirming. 2 Corinthians 5.18. It is saying here that just as God sent Jesus to reconcile or to bring man back to God through him, Christ. He has also given us a ministry of reconciliation that we should bring man back to God. Now, in verse 19, it says, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed to us the word of reconciliation. So we all have a ministry. And the word ministry means service or work. That is from the Lord, right? And that ministry, he tells us, is to bring man to Christ. This is where our role as ambassadors comes in. So we will look at the word ambassador, and it's in the verse 20. He's saying, because of what I have said so far about having a ministry of reconciliation, in verse 20, he says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, 
be ye reconciled to God. So he's saying, because you have been given a ministry of reconciliation to bring men back to God, you have become an ambassador. So he's basically defining the role of an ambassador. If God calls you something, like he just tells you you are, you are a citizen, it's important to really um, have a good understanding of what it means to be a citizen. Because otherwise you cannot fulfill God's plan and his intentions for making you a citizen. In the same tone, if God called you an ambassador, it's important to do a study on ambassador to see what an ambassador does, their role, what they're supposed to do. Otherwise, you will not be fulfilling your role effectively and you will miss out on God's purpose for making you an ambassador. He didn't have to make you an ambassador, but he chose to make you that. So the question is, why have you made me an ambassador? What am I supposed to do? That is why we must pursue understanding of what it means to be an ambassador. Okay, so we'll, for the next um, couple of minutes, we will be talking about uh, what it means to be an ambassador for Christ. Okay, now the word itself, an ambassador, is a very interesting word. So an ambassador is a person who is sent from one country to another country and they are there to represent or to deliver a message that the king of that country that they came from had given them. And I hope this makes sense. But in our world now, we have ambassadors. Australia uh, has an ambassador in every country of the world. So let's say take Samoa, for example. Uh, there, is a, there is an ambassador of Australia in Samoa. And what are they doing in Samoa? How come they're not in Australia? They are in Samoa because they are representing uh, the interest of Australia in Samoa. They, they, if Samoans want to know about Australia, they go to the ambassador of Australia. In fact, if Samoans want to come to Australia, they have to go to the embassy, where, which is overseen or by the ambassador of Australia. Okay? So he is there not representing his will. He is there representing the will of the country that he represents. And this is so important because the reason why it's important to understand you are, first of all, now identified as a member of God's family and as a citizen of his kingdom is to just give you that concrete identity that you have, that therefore you've been sent from him and you are on this earth for his work, for his will, for his purpose. Jesus prayed it. He taught the disciples how to pray. And just in the beginning uh, verses of that prayer, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God, our father is in heaven. He wants his will to be represented on this earth. So what does he do? He sends his children who are also citizens of his kingdom in heaven, who have now become on this earth ambassadors. Why? Because we're here not representing ourselves. We're here representing our king in his lifestyle and delivering his message that is the gospel to the world so an ambassador has two main roles the first role is they represent to present something is to show it so represent means that you are um, I'm displaying something that you've already seen okay so we know what christ is like we have a spirit in us. We read the word. We find out about his character. We live according to it. We know how he's like. So we, the best scripture, actually, um, to, to explain what I'm talking about, um, I believe it's in um, Romans chapter 13 and verse number 13. It says, and let us walk honestly as in the day. So it's telling us how we're supposed to live, right? Not in rioting. And the word rioting there means, you know, like living a chaotic life. And it says, and drunkenness and in, and in chamberings and in wantonness, not in strife with people and envying. It, Paul is saying here, let us not walk in any of these things. But he says in verse 14, but put on ye the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what an ambassador does. An ambassador puts on the person they're representing. You see, as a citizen of heaven, a member of family of God's kingdom, you put on Jesus. You put on his character, you put on his nature, and you talk about his message. 
you preach his message. That is a true ambassador. You put on the king. You put on his nature. You put on his character. Uh, I'll just go back a little bit there. So our identity as family gives us a sense of intimacy, uh, a relationship, and belonging. Our identity as citizens of heaven uh, gives us a lifestyle that we must live. Our uh, duty as ambassadors tells us what, we, what we're doing on this earth in the first place. And we're here to represent Christ in our lifestyle and in our speech. Okay, it says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Proverbs 13, 17, it says a wicked messenger falls into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is helped. See, so ambassador is a messenger. So they, they're carrying a message from their kin or from their, uh, their nation or from their government to another place. In John 17, he says, you are not of this world. So therefore, he says, the world will hit you. Why? Because you're not representing the world. You're not conforming to their standards. So they're supposed to hit you. And that's why um, persecution is the norm, being uh, a born-again uh, citizen of God's kingdom. It has to be the norm. Because if your lifestyle is being accepted by the world, then there's a question mark there. Why are you getting accepted? Jesus said, as they persecute me, they will persecute you. So how come the Lord got persecuted, but you don't get persecuted? Because then we have to check our lives. Are we conforming to the world? But to understand that to be a faithful messenger is to be a great ambassador who is walking in the understanding that you're here on this earth. You've been born from heaven. You are a citizen of God's kingdom, a member of his family. You're not here representing yourself. You're here to represent your king, your government, your kingdom. And it's the Lord Jesus. Okay. So uh, and just the simplest way to understand who an ambassador is, you are a messenger sent from God to live your life, to, to reflect his nature and to preach the gospel to people. It means that um, in your workplace, in your workplace, you're not there for profit. You're not there to make money. If you have a business, you're not, you're not, you don't have the business to make money. Um, Jesus teaches us that in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It says, seek first the kingdom, seek to pursue the kingdom and its righteousness. And it says, all these things will be added unto you. And what was he talking about? What you eat, what you drink, what you wear. In other words, you pursue your role as an ambassador. And God says, I will look after you. So if you are at a job, that job is your mission field. You're there to bring those souls to the Lord Jesus. You're there to bring them into God's kingdom. You're there to to do your ministry of reconciliation is what we just read. That's why you're there. If you have a business, it's not for profit. You're there as a minister of reconciliation to meet those clients or the people that you come to contact with, those customers, and to display Christ to them and to preach the gospel to them, bring them into the kingdom. Because God is reconciling the world to himself. And he's using his children to do that. And you, my brother or sister, you are also recruited in this agenda that the Father has. So he says, um, in, for example, in Matthew uh, chapter uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, he says to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and guess who they glorify? The Father, which is in heaven. Why? Because then they know you're representing not yourself. You see, they know what people on this earth are like. So when they see someone who is different, they immediately know that they are representing something else, something greater than themselves. See, that's what Jesus is saying here. You let your light shine, walk in love, you know, demonstrate the fruits of the Holy Spirit, put on Christ Jesus, and men will see, they will see you, and they will give glory to who you're representing, the Father. Luke chapter 10 and verse number 16, uh, this is Jesus speaking. He says, he that hears me, uh, he sends out, his, Jesus sends out his, um, his disciples, and here's what he says to them. He says, whoever hears you, hears me. And he that despises you despises me. And he that despises me despises him that sent me. Okay, so just to simplify this, basically he's saying that as an ambassador, because you're representing me, don't take things personal. If you get rejected, it's not you getting rejected. It's Jesus that gets rejected. If people accept you, they accept Christ. If he, they don't accept you, they don't accept Christ. Because you are not representing yourself. John 8, 28, and it says the. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall know that I am he, 
and that I do nothing of myself. Every ambassador should have this statement. I do nothing of myself. Why? Because you're not representing yourself. You're representing the government or the king that sent you, Jesus. It says, but my father has taught me I speak these things. So Jesus was God living in a, in a human body, but he was also the, the first example of an ambassador that we know of. And he was an awesome, excellent ambassador. Like he says here, he did nothing of himself. So everything you saw Jesus do was the father living through him. That is amazing. So he says, I and my father are one. Because he says, if you see me, you've seen the father. It is the, the, the strength and the power of that representation that Jesus was representing everything that the father was. The word became flesh and dwelt among men. But he says, as the father sent me, so I sent you. So just as Jesus came and in every way represented the father, he sent it us that in every way we represent Jesus. See, that's the power of ambassadorship. When we, when we have this mentality and we're walking in it, one thing about ambassadors, and you can even look at the examples uh, of ambassadors in this world, the government looks after them. They provide for them. They protect them. And they also give them authority and power to be able to do the work that they are called to do. In fact, the, the, the government backs them up because they're not representing themselves. And, and the point is sometimes we run into all of these problems because we represent ourselves. You see, but if we're really doing what we're supposed to do, representing Christ in our character and preaching the gospel, then we're backed by God because it's no longer us anymore, but it's him that we're representing. So we're backed by him. So one thing an ambassador gets is provision. Provision. Because you're representing God, he takes responsibility to look after you. Uh, that's from Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. And Jesus says, uh, we read down to verse 33. Jesus says, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we be clothed? See, the world out there is built on economy. Everything is about money. When you rely on the economy as your source, then it can control you. And it is no wonder that in the book of Revelations, those, it says, that take the mark of the beast, they couldn't buy or sell. You see, Satan is going to use the system, the economy, to control people. And if all you can think of and all you can rely on is the economy to meet your needs, in other words, you think that your job is the source of your provision. What happens when you have to lose your job because, of, because you're standing up for your faith? Then you probably have to compromise because you don't, you're not understanding that if you're there representing God, it doesn't matter if you get fired, God will look after you. He says, look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store up in barns, but the Father feeds them. How much more shall he not feed you? See, when we're standing and representing his will, the Father provides for us. For all these things, the Gentiles seek. Uh, for your heavenly Father. So he's saying, you are not a Gentile. Don't live like that. This is the Lord saying, my people will be known for their dependency on God as the source of their provision. Because remember, we talked about it from the start. You've been adopted into a family. God is now your father. Now God commands fathers to provide for their children. And he being the ultimate father, he says, how will he not provide good things for those who ask him? Okay, so your provision comes from the father. But he tells you there that there's a condition for that provision. And that's what we talk about, requirements and things like that. He says, but ye seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The, the, this provision doesn't just happen. The Lord is saying, if you stand in and you represent me, you, you represent me in character and in speech and in preaching the gospel, then I have an obligation to back you up and provide for you. Another thing that an ambassador has is protection. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 26, and all the way to 31, Jesus says this, and he says, Do not fear them, um, therefore, uh, because there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed and nothing hid that shall not be known. In other words, he's going to be telling you to preach some things but, and don't be afraid to preach it. What I tell you in darkness, you speak it in the light. In other words, speak truth and don't be afraid to speak the truth at all times. Because your Lord commands you. If you're going to be his ambassador and he tells you to go and preach something and you go and preach something else or you compromise the message, then you're not an ambassador. 
It says, what I tell you in darkness, you speak it in the light. And what you hear, um, what you hear in your ear, you preach it from the rooftop. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. In other words, people can take this body out. They can kill the body, but they cannot kill your soul because they don't have access to the soul. Okay. But if there is anyone we should fear, we shouldn't fear those that kill the body. We should only fear those that, the one that can destroy the soul. And it tells us that is God. But rather fear him, which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. See, the danger of fearing man is that you lose sight of who we should actually fear, which is God, who has the ability not just to destroy the physical body, but to torment the soul eternally in hell. In verse 29, he says, um, Are not two sparrows sold for a father, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? In other words, he's saying here that even the birds of the air, it seems like they have no value. But he says, not one of them will drop dead without the father's uh, awareness or his permission. Then he goes on to say, in, verse, um, in the continuing verse 30, he says, but your very hairs on your head, your hair on your head, they are all numbered. That means you're special to God. Verse 31, fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Preaching the gospel um, and representing Christ in this world filled with darkness may mean persecution, imprisonment, may mean death, all kinds of things. Jesus does say that, okay? But he says, don't be afraid. So as an ambassador, you have protection from the Lord and he's going to protect you and make sure that you fully deliver or do the work that he's assigned to you to do before uh, you go to heaven. Uh, but this is the mentality that we must have, that when you got born again um, and it, you were told that your sins were forgiven, that was half of the story. The other half is understanding that you entered a new environment called the kingdom of God, the government of God. And in this government, you have become a family of God. You're not just a, just a uh, citizen only. You are now a family but you, who has a relationship, an intimate relationship and, and uh, with, with the Father, that when you go to him in prayer, there's that intimacy because you're not talking to a, some force that is out there. You're talking to a Father that you can relate to because you have a spirit in you crying about Father. Okay, And then you also became a citizen of his kingdom. And as a citizen, uh, it gives you the required lifestyle of the citizen. How do people know you're a citizen of God's kingdom? How do people know you are uh, a, a disciple of Christ, he says, by love. And we talked about that. The high, love is the highest form of loving God, loving people is the highest form of righteousness there is. You see, but he's giving you the ability, Romans 5, 5, to be able to leave that, leave that out. And then the other thing we learned is that we are also, well, we have also become ambassadors. We're not here on this earth by an accident. There's a specific, definite reason why God has put us on this earth in such a time. So you can look around you with all the issues and the problems that's happening. And you know what? You have been born for such a time as this. God put you here in this time because he's equipped you to be able to live out uh, the life that he's calling you to live.